Hi, I'm Jeff Sachs of Columbia University and very thankful to MIT for holding this workshop on artificial intelligence and the future of work and very grateful to Eric Brynjolfsson and the MIT initiative on the, the digital economy for enabling me to participate uh, virtually, even though uh, I'm in Asia today. Otherwise, I certainly would be with you in Cambridge. I believe that this uh, question of AI and work is really of profound significance because I think the transformations ahead will be enormous. And I want to explain why and what I believe are some of the key policy issues. From my point of view, the digital revolution is as great a technological advance as the great advances since the beginning of the industrial age, uh, the advent of the steam engine, uh, the advent of the internal combustion engine, uh, the advent of electrification. I think the digital revolution, which has been underway uh, roughly from the 1930s onward, is having already deep and pervasive effects on all aspects of the economy as well as all aspects of social life and politics. And with artificial intelligence and especially the machine learning uh, algorithms that have uh, proven their remarkable worth in recent years, we will experience a dramatic acceleration uh, of those changes. They can be positive, to be sure, but they also can be adverse unless we handle them properly. So in a very uh, brief synopsis uh, of my views, I'd like to make the following points. First, all great general purpose technologies, whether it's steam electrification or the digital revolution, have uh, pervasive effects on not only the labor market and on income distribution, but on led to uh, mass automation of work, especially in the goods producing sectors of the economy up till now. That means in agriculture, uh, in manufacturing, in mining, and in construction. In those sectors, we've already seen an enormous displacement of basic, uh, relatively low-skilled labor, say, uh, labor uh, with education uh, up to uh, the high school degree or even some college, uh, with huge uh, shifts in labor demand, uh, against uh, such low-skill labor and in favor of smart machines and high-skilled uh, labor, uh, especially uh, professionals with advanced degrees that are complementary to these systems of automation. Uh, in general, we talk about capital skill complementarity or technology skill complementarity. Uh, in practice, uh, I think what that really means is that uh, skilled professionals, especially uh, engineers, uh, are redesigning uh, systems of work uh, that uh, save on relatively lower skilled labor uh, and uh, that are intensive, especially in smart machines. And the result of that is falling wages and uh, declining employment for lower skilled workers and a significant boost of earnings and employment for uh, workers of the high skills that are either the inventors and designers of these new technologies or are complementary with these smart systems. I believe that uh, these basic shifts uh, are the main explanation for the declining share of labor income in national income, uh, a uh, process of decline that has uh, clearly accelerated in the last 15 to 20 years, and that is clearly a worldwide phenomenon uh, where lower skilled workers are not finding employment or only finding employment at falling uh, 
real wages uh, and in which uh, more and more of national income is earned by professionals or by uh, physical capital. Uh, the robots uh, that uh, are uh, gaining uh, their share of uh, production processes or of intellectual property, uh, the uh, patents uh, and other IP uh, that are uh, reaping uh, growing returns. Artificial intelligence, especially the new uh, deep learning uh, of uh, uh, machines uh, with the deep neural nets, for example, is uh, already accelerating this process. But I think that it's going to have a further pervasive effects on the job market, uh, probably uh, that are more complex uh, and disruptive than the changes of the past. Uh, part of the change will be an acceleration of existing trends that standardized work, uh, certainly clerical work, will continue to uh, be replaced by smart machines. Uh, work based on pattern recognition, whether it's uh, surveillance of uh, protective security systems or whether it's uh, very sophisticated uh, reading of uh, diagnostic uh, medical images will increasingly be replaced by smart machines. And of course, one of the things that we see as machines get better is that work gets reorganized. And that clearly is underway in the shift from brick and mortar commerce in retail trade to e-commerce. Uh, we're likely to see a, a dramatic uh, shift away from employment in retail trade, one of the major sectors of the economy, with a huge economization of labor by shifting to uh, e-based trade. And this, I think, uh, will be an acceleration of trends against workers with high school or less than uh, bachelor's degrees, because right now retail trade is perhaps the major bin of uh, uh, labor uh, that uh, is uh, providing decent work uh, for uh, workers with that level of educational attainment. So what has happened in the goods producing sectors is now likely to uh, dramatically accelerate in uh, certain parts of the service economy. What could be quite different from patterns of the past, though, is that many very high skilled jobs are also likely to be implicated. I've already mentioned the radiologists uh, who will be replaced by smart machines. But it's very likely that in our profession of education, uh, machines will replace a lot of what we do. Uh, certainly the MOOCs are already doing that. Uh, but I think the uh, range of educational services that can be provided at high quality and very low cost through online connected classrooms, uh, distance learning, uh, new uh, learning algorithms uh, will definitely uh, scale tremendously in the coming years. And I suspect in uh, other areas uh, of medicine, for example, with the uh, Watson type uh, smart diagnostician machines, uh, with the remote sensing of patients and so forth, we can economize tremendously on skilled personnel in the health sector and with machines that teach themselves through reinforcement learning, as we've seen with the uh, AlphaGo Zero uh, becoming in 72 hours uh, the world's greatest ever Go player, uh, we're likely to see even significant parts of engineering essentially being substituted by uh, uh, ever uh, smarter machines. All of this will have uh, pervasive effects on the labor market and on the distribution of income. Of course, we're seeing other phenomena as well that are equally dramatic. One is the remarkable uh, concentration of wealth that's taking place 
because of big data. The uh, big five uh, information uh, technology aggregators, uh, Apple and Amazon and Alphabet, Microsoft and Facebook, uh, have surged in cumulative value to more than $3.2 trillion now. Uh, an astounding uh, concentration of wealth with very few employees uh, indeed uh, at stake because of the vast returns to big data. This is already having profound social ramifications and uh, political ramifications uh, that I think uh, we're only uh, starting to see. Obviously, we're also experiencing tectonic shifts in uh, politics as well. The 2016 elections may prove to have been a watershed where uh, smart uh, algorithms deeply disrupted our politics, micro-targeting of uh, political messages, uh, perhaps involving uh, Russia, uh, obviously played a significant role. If uh, Cambridge Analytica is to be believed, uh, it's uh, big data bases and uh, sophisticated targeting of what they claim to be more than 230 million Americans uh, is a profound and uh, actually very upsetting uh, new aspect of our politics. We're only beginning to come to grips with that. From a policy point of view, I think uh, we as economists and this community broadly face one overwhelming question, and that is how can we ensure that a technology that is so powerful and so productive and with so much promise of further gains of productivity in the future should have outcomes that are uh, inclusive in their benefits, uh, that are Pareto improving uh, across the society at any given time and across generations. Those of us uh, who are watching the unfolding of this technology have a right to be alarmed. We're seeing concentrations of wealth, widening uh, income inequalities, uh, a loss of empowerment of young uh, owners of labor relative to older owners of capital. So we're seeing huge effects on income distribution, wealth distribution, generational impacts that really have the possibility of immiserizing large parts of the population, even as uh, these technologies raise overall output. We've seen it before. Indeed, I would say it's part and parcel of general purpose technologies that significant parts of the population can actually be immiserized. But we also have tools to uh, prevent that kind of immiserization. And we as uh, policy analysts ought to be thinking hard about how to ensure inclusive benefits. Let me mention very quickly in closing a few ways. One is through expanded, enhanced, revamped skill training. Obviously, keeping ahead of the machines or better said, keeping complementary to ever smarter machines is key. We don't know quite what that means. Uh, we tend to think it means more STEM education, but it may mean more education in the human skills that are complementary to the machine capabilities. But what it surely means is making absolutely certain that uh, all parts of society can have access to the skill and education that they need in the future, not just the rich kids. Uh, and this means uh, wider access to higher education, better financing terms, pathways to free higher education, lower costs of higher education, in part through uh, online uh, educational uh, curricula and uh, other uh, methods. So that's number one is, uh, is the, the human capital side. Second is sharing 
in the increased leisure and basic job benefits that will be enabled by these technologies. America is an odd place. We're the only country that does not guarantee paid vacation, for example. And our work hours are much longer than in Europe. Uh, some Puritans among us view Europe's shorter work hours as a bad thing. I view Europe's long vacation times guaranteed for all workers to be a part of the decency and high quality of life of those societies. And we should be sharing the benefits of even reduced work and more leisure time much more widely among the population. A third dimension certainly is the redistribution of income. It doesn't have to be universal basic income, doesn't have to be untethered to work, but it should mean decent wages for all who are at work, an expanded earned income tax credit, a reverse social security where every newborn gets a, a capital grant in effect, uh, enabling them to own a piece of the new robotics and smart machine world to be uh, equity owners uh, in this uh, equity-based, capital-based uh, economy uh, are parts of the new uh, redistributive forces ahead. And I think a fourth area comes in politics. What are we going to do with these uh, big data aggregators? They're super powerful. They're very intrusive. They've accumulated uh, incredible amounts of wealth and power. They uh, were part of the manipulation of our political process recently. I think there's going to be a very, very serious look about how to restrain the power that comes from a few big data aggregators who have access to almost everything we do in our lives now because it's all online and are commercializing our private lives in ways that many of us don't condone or believe is safe for society. So all of this is to say, let's not uh, underestimate the massive changes ahead. As economists, uh, we are right to believe that technological improvements are potentially Pareto improving uh, within a generation and over time but it will require lots of policy innovation uh, and lots of uh, boldness and vision to ensure that the actual benefits of these new wondrous and rapidly advancing technologies, in fact, are uh, broadly enjoyed. And I think that's a major uh, challenge and opportunity for us to uh, help ensure. Thank you for letting me share these uh, brief remarks with you. Best wishes on the conference, and I will look forward to carrying uh, to catching up with uh, Eric and uh, others of you very soon, uh, and all success on the conference. Thanks very much. You know, Jeff's comments are, are, are a really good segue to the next portion of our program, so